welcome to this panel. Um, it's uh, great to be among you and uh, to discuss uh, Turkey's uh, European agenda and policy. Um, today we have um, three uh, speakers, or we had originally three speakers planned for this session, but um, it seems that maybe the two speakers who are here will have more time uh, to elaborate on their arguments, because the third uh, paper giver doesn't seem to be uh, the paper givers don't seem to be around, but maybe they will join us later on. So we'll have to keep our options open uh, when it comes to this. Um, before we start, let me just introduce myself. Um, I am Dimitris Tarukas. Uh, I'm an associate professor of uh, international relations at uh, Bilkian University in Turkey uh, and currently an adjunct, adjunct professor at uh, George Washington University uh, in Washington, D.C. And it's a great pleasure to welcome the two paper givers that we have with us today. Uh, First, starting with um, Dr. Carol uh, Kujava. If, is it, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Sorry. It's Kujava, it's fine. Yeah. Don't worry. Kujava, sorry. Um, and uh, Carol is going to talk to us about um, a very timely issue indeed, uh, the role of the refugee issue uh, in EU-Turkey relations. Um, Carol is a senior fellow uh, at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign uh, in the US. And if there are any more affiliations that he has, I'm sure he's going to mention them himself because I couldn't find them anywhere else um, whilst preparing for this. Uh, and after Carol, we are going to hear from um, Nasu Sofuolo, uh, who is um, a PhD student at Kadir Has University in Istanbul. Uh, and he has co-authored the paper with uh, Professor uh, Dimitrios Triandafilou, also from Kadir Has entitled An Ontological Security Approach to Greek-Turkish Relations and Turkey's European Union Bid. Uh, welcome both. Thank you very much for being online and ready to talk to us. Uh, without any further ado, we will start with um, Carol's presentation. So, Carol, the floor is yours. Um, hello, guys. Kalimera. Assalamu alaikum to everyone. <laughs> so, uh, good to see you here. And... Um, uh, let me give me a small update. I'm working at the uh, university in Poland and at the same time. So I am assistant professor in uh, Buesba University and also research associate at the Illinois University. Uh, so my main field is actually Middle East and the Balkans. And I should to present my paper with uh, vice director of the Skisheyer University with Ibrahim Kaya. However, he's very busy nowadays, so it's very hard to, to to, uh, to find the time to provide this lecture. So uh, I will do, uh, I, I will, in my paper, I'm going to show the role of the crisis in bi bilateral re relations. And I will try to analyze um, uh, this uh, relation between Turkey and um, and uh, European Union uh, during the migration crisis. So uh, essentially, I would like to answer whether the migration help to overcome some of the difficulties between Turkey and EU or vice versa, increase the crisis and tension between these two, two uh, between Turkey and EU. Uh, considering this issue, I, I wonder whether it is, uh, or I would like also to analyze the attitude of the member state to, to refugees and Turkey towards this, uh, um, this migration and how they are trying to sort out together this problem. So this will be actually the main aim of this paper. And uh, before uh, expressed, uh, I mean, to show this uh, attitude of the states and uh, how and the impact of the migration crisis on, on Turkey and EU, first I have to some facts about the Turkish, uh, Turkish policy toward the refugees. And uh, the point is Turkey is, uh, as we know, playing the key role in the migration uh, crisis. And uh, uh, this is the main route and we have now nowadays three and a half million more than three and a half million refugees uh, from in in turkey and before i started working in turkey it was like in 2011 2012 it was um, only i mean only there was one million of the people who are trying to find a shelter uh, on the turkish soil and i live in gaziantep so i saw this gradually how the problem uh, appear and getting more difficult for the Turkish authorities. And then I moved to Çanakkale in the Aegean uh, region and the, the wave of the migration appeared 
a uh, couple of years I mean years later also in this area so uh, Tur Turkey Turkish people the the migration uh, is affecting the Turkish society a lot and uh, according to estimates uh, we have more um, uh, majority of the refugees living in Turkey are uh, mainly uh, from Syria and uh, we have also a lot of people from the Azerbaijan and from Iraq uh, so uh, in terms of the gender and majority of them are men we have a big amount also of the children and so uh, and the status of this uh, from the very beginning of this migration crisis uh, Turkish pride uh, to, to Turkish society uh, trying to uh, to accept this r big number of of the refugees and uh, they were trying to treat them as a guest they didn't want to call even the uh, Turkish president of uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan trying to emphasize that we should not call them uh, refugees uh, but we should uh, call them uh, we should recognize them as a guest so and also uh, essentially the entire society trying to do the same uh, so we saw a lot of positive uh, uh, elements of the of the Turkish uh, politics, and they uh, try and they were really helping them from the from the very beginning, and um, and moreover we saw this kind of solidarity among the Turkish people toward the Syrian refugees who were trying to to find a shelter in on the Turkish soil, and there are several reasons why the Turkey conduct such a uh, such a policy, the, they opened the gates toward them. So uh, first of all, they were thinking, especially it was very visible in Gaziantep when I when I work, that uh, they really believe that refugees will stay. I mean, the war in Syria will not take such a long time, and uh, now this is almost like ten years. But in that time, from the very beginning of the crisis, they were thinking it will take like maybe one year, and then after the crisis, the the Turkish uh, Turkish uh, companies will uh, move come over to to Syria and start to rebuild the country. So uh, the attitude was very positive, and uh, there were a lot of perspectives and hopes to to uh, for Turkish authorities to rebuild uh, Syria, and that the war will finish very very short, and the Syrians will uh, come back to their homes. So there was the fa first assumption of the Syrian of the Turkish government. The second was the Turkish, uh, also the positive attitude uh, of the Turkish uh, so society and the government also was the effect of the Muslim so solidarity. I mean, um, Turkish people feel that they used to live in the same country and also if you will take a look at the Gaziantep, a lot of families were, I mean, some of the uh, Turkish families living in Gaziantep have the, their relatives on the other side of the border, so they have in Syria at the same time. So they have really strong bonds and they express their sol solidarity and Islamic sol solidarity toward the uh, Syrian refugees. And that's why uh, also there's the re 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 religious rules like the zakat, they need to have to all poor people. So the po attitude was very positive and uh, I have to point out also a very important aspect, the cultural aspect of the Turkish society. Uh, it is about the um, sensitivity of the Turkish society toward the children. If you will live in Turkey, you will find out that Turkish people are very sensitive about the children. They really take care of them. They uh, they, they, ha they have very high, um, uh, I mean, level of the of the kindergarten. So they are very sensitive about the children. That's why they they w are trying to do their best to help the people living in. Uh, in I mean, the the Syrian uh, children to to provide them uh, a help and uh, education. Uh, they are trying to pull it. So this is very also important aspect of this. And uh, moreover, currently speaking, uh, I mean the positive attitude uh, uh, of the uh, of the, the roots of the Turkey. I mean, Turkey is very uh, um, country of the refugees. They. Majority. When I work in Turkey, my classes we have like, uh, uh, Cherkes people, people from uh, different roots, and they all of them actually their relatives came from the Balkans, from the Caucasus region, and some from uh, uh, from many different uh, part of the of the country. So essentially, they 
they they knew how to uh, how knew how to deal with this uh, this new wave of uh, migration also Turkey uh, many years before during the crisis in um, in Iraq they decided to 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 host one million Iraqis so there, there was very positive uh, rule of the, a positive attitude toward the refugees as a result of the historical as well uh, conditions. Uh, Carol, sorry to interrupt you, but I think we have lost you in terms of seeing you. Your, your camera must be off. Would you mind turning it on again? Right. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, uh, let's say uh, attitude of the positive, and Turkey in the same time gained some benefits. Uh, um, some of the uh, companies start to uh, uh, Syrian uh, businessmen start to relocate to to start to own companies, and this was also very of this uh, of this policy. And uh, moreover, uh, were treating uh, Syrian refugees as a cheap laborers. I mean, company very happy because the migration crisis appear in that time. Employ the laborers from Syria, so there were some positive benefits. Important one was in speaking uh, uh, on, on behalf of Turkey. We were trying to improve relation. Uh, thanks to this crisis, the the Turkey and. The So there was the aim to find some of, of the uh, common solution models. And finally, as a result of this, agreed to sign the directive to the to the to to to, to Turkey to to uh, make a deal. And finally, as a result of this, they promised Turkey to uh, to uh, to move to free movement for uh, for Turkish citizens to the European Union. They promised. And moreover, they uh, promise also to um, uh, implement some reforms in order to um, um, have Turkey to be member state, and promise them uh, to give money, like three billion euro, in that time. So, um, uh, from the beginning, the, it helped to overcome some of the difficulties between Turkey and EU because both of the countries need each other, and uh, there was the first aim to get closer between Turkey in, in, in European Union. Um, however, uh, after years, the, the attitude and also the generally or public opinion in Turkey changed because the, the cost of the hosting such a great number of the people also increased and the economic crisis was very uh, visible and unemployment and uh, inflation, all of this affect the entire uh, entire society, and they were less happy to host the, the, the Turkish refugee uh, to the Syrian refugees. And according to some estimates conducted by the Hajat University, 70% of, of, of uh, Turkish people start to think negative about the refugees. So the negative uh, opinions start to be more uh, popular among the Turkish people. And uh, from that moment, also Turkey were trying to find some alternative solutions. So they were trying to uh, uh, promote the buffer zone to create a buffer zone in the northern part of the Syria, in order to uh, build, um, to resettle the Syrian refugees to the uh, to the northern part of Syria, and then also in the same time somehow to marginalize the rule of the uh, Kurdish people who are, were living who are living in this part of the of the Syria, and to not let them to establish their own separate uh, state. So this was very important also for the from the perspective of the Turkey to uh, at the same time to on the one side to sort out the problem of the Syrian refugees and at the same time to uh, somehow to marginalize the uh, separatist movement from uh, from uh, from uh, from the some of the some some organization uh, uh, of uh, representing Kurd, uh, Kurds so um, there was the main idea to, to build this uh, buffer zone. However, European Union was not so much uh, positive about this. They were a bit skeptical to establish such a buffer zone. 
even this Turkey was trying to promote this idea to, to sort out their own problem in their own way. Uh, and um, let's take a look on our other side of the coin. I'm, I mean, actually the position of the European Union toward the refugees and how they affect the uh, bilateral relations between Turkey and European Union. So starting from Germany, uh, like Turkey was trying to open the gates. They claim that uh, we have to open uh, we have to uh, we have to that we can do it. It was very popular in that time a slogan in among the German society, and they really hope that situation will uh, will help and uh, a lot they let a lot of the refugees to settle to move to to Germany. And uh, this is also the result of the many uh, many aspects, especially Turkey. Uh, Germany has uh, also. Uh, similar to Turkey, maybe not such uh, similar uh, similarities, but they have also migration st uh, uh, routes. And after the second war, a lot of people from Turkey, from Spain, even from Poland settled. So they used to live with uh, with migrants, with refugees. And so uh, it, it also uh, was the positive attitude of the European Union toward there was the res result of the positive attitude of the uh, Germany toward the refugees. So uh, uh, in the same time, uh, some of the countries were used to represent different, uh, just opposite opinion, like Poland and Hungary. Uh, they treat this as a threat for the national security and also for the economy. So this was also a result of the some of the, uh, let's say, history, uh, because uh, Poland and Hungary used to live in the same uh, barrack. They, were, they, they didn't have touch uh, with foreigners uh, as Germany after the second war and moreover there was a uh, the problem with uh, 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 after the first time i mean polish people since they became member of, of the european union the, the attitude of the polish people changed toward the foreigners and more moreover we have to uh, history historically speaking to, to polish people considered themselves uh, a bit like the uh, protector of the christian values so they beat european union and uh, uh, and Brussels as a as a mainly leftist, and they believe that are, they have a pretty. Uh, they don't represent the the real European identity, and they consider them as a as a as a leftist, as a even communist. So uh, European Union uh, actually is not so among the conservative. Uh, 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 I mean, uh, parties are not considered. Uh, as a real European uh, uh, values, and in fact, they afraid that European is trying to destroy the Polish conservative family. Uh, so the point is like the they didn't have such a they were trying to, they were not so much uh, positive about uh, about this attitude, and they were trying to uh, they were not so willing to prom uh, to let the refugees to to settle on the Polish. Uh, soil, and uh, so actually there was the the main problem in bi bilateral relation because we don't have this kind of solidarity between uh, between European countries. So uh, nowadays we have a new way to sort out this problem. I mean, new new idea to sort out this problem. Uh, mainly the uh, European Commission is to trying to promote the new solution. Actually. Um, uh, for them, will be the best if this uh, some of the European Union, uh, some of the EU countries uh, who, which uh, uh, I mean, these countries uh, um, who I mean, they they will not accept the refugees. They will if they will re reject the uh, uh, small num um, uh, amount of the refugees. So then they will need uh, to pay money. So uh, this solution actually seems to be very pragmatical and good uh, in relation because uh, if Poland and Hungary will be forced to to be um, uh, to to accept this uh, amount of the refugees, the reaction will be opposite. And uh, uh, since we have this kind of Catholic uh, Bible belt, and the people from this area are a bit more skeptical about uh, about this. Uh, refugees and also one of the arguments of this conservative people is that uh, Poland already accepted uh, 
spread people from Ukraine. So actually, why we have to host more? So this are uh, this kind of attitude is very popular among the people from the west, eastern and uh, from the uh, southern part of Poland. So this uh, actually this is the result of the history as well. So actually the, the, uh, the solution to find a common ground and to find a common way in this case is pretty good, is the most pr pragmatical uh, because like European Union will uh, will actually Pol Poland and Hungary will need to pay money if they will not accept this uh, amount of the uh, refugees. And uh, in the long perspective, I don't believe that uh, that uh, the relation between Turkey and the migration crisis will uh, uh, help uh, Turkey and EU to get closer, because actually they know already that they will be not uh, Turkey will be not the member state in the European Union. So actually, I think that. Uh, uh, that both countries, I mean, European Union and, and, and also Turkey need to find a common ground and to, to, to <coughs> sort out the problem of refugees uh, dipl diplomatically because they don't have choice. I mean, they, because they, are, they, are, they, are, they have a strong bonds uh, because of the geopolitics and they have to find the, the common way to sort out this problem. However, uh, Turkey will try to put pressure on the European Union in this case. So. Okay, thank you very much indeed for, for my presentation. And Okay, uh, thank you very much, Carol, for your uh, presentation. We will, um, if you agree, come back to um, your paper uh, in terms of questions and uh, comments and a discussion once we have finished uh, all presentations. Um, and I'm now happy to move on to Dimitra uh, Mikhail. Uh, who is uh, who was able to join us, and we are very glad. Um, and uh, Dimitra, I suppose, is going to present on behalf of both herself and uh, Thanas Samaras. Uh, I will give you the floor, Dimitra, to to um, begin without um, wasting any more time on my part. Uh, please do try to stick to fifteen minutes so that we can discuss uh, your paper later on. Thank you. Um, Dimitra, please unmute. Do you hear me now? Yes, we do. Great. Perfect. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for being here. And I'm terribly sorry for my little delay. I had an internet connection problem. I stabilized it now. Um, I'm going to share um, a PowerPoint um, presentation right now. So excuse me for one minute. Uh, Tell me if you see the presentation because I have to show you some stuff. Um, do you see it? I think it's about to load. So uh, okay. you are starting. Yes, we can see it now. Okay. So I'm going to talk to you about efforts in uh, international politics. Farrell refers to efforts as one of the most enigmatic words in the whole vocabulary. Utilizing the definition given by Aristotle and McCroskey, ethos is crystallized um, in the perceived characteristic of a potential message source, which determines uh, the attitude towards it. So in this light, ethos is quite important in the emergence of polarized issues, and especially when national interests are threatened and emotions are running high. Uh, come on. So basically, ethos in, in rhetoric is um, identified with someone's credibility, which will enable him to convince his audience. There are three types of ethos. Initial ethos, uh, meaning the speaker's credibility before the Communication Act, based on his individual characteristics, his deeds, and his general image. Then we have deduced ethos, uh, the speaker's credibility produced during the Communication Act, and thirdly, final ethos, the credibility of the message after the Communication Act. This triple breakdown indicates the ways in which credibility can be built or destroyed in the public sphere. In times of contention and crisis, um, a politician can build his ethos through rhetorically deconstructing an initial, deduce, or final ethos of uh, his opponent. On international level, this may take place uh, between actors having conflicted interests, or at least if the one side perceives them as such. 
So the most suitable tool for this purpose is negative athletic argument. It is about primary personal attacks or responses to an argument counterattacking the person producing them. The main characteristic of the ad hominem argument is the focus on the conditions in which the message was produced and not on its content. The typical structure of the ad hominem argument is that of the abusive type. We're going to see it afterwards. Uh, and it has this form. The X is an individual of a bad character. Therefore, whatever X says should be rejected. It has to be pointed out here that the nature of bad character is specified for the ad hominem type or subtype used by the source. So, uh, you know, being aware of ad hominem's utility in times of crisis and uncertainty, the current focus of this research was the examination of ad hominem arguments uh, mobilized by Turkish government in their international web page, to be more specific, uh, towards European Union and certain member states. And this um, was like the, the uh, project in order to map let's say, Europe's authentic deconstruction under President Erdogan's uh, uh, presidency and being in power uh, with uh, enhanced, let's say, duties uh, in a certain period of time where Turkey relations were being challenged. That's why period of analysis is 2017 to 2019. The methodology followed was qualitative content analysis based on Walton typology and the protocol designed by Thanasis Samaras for credibility check and identification. So during the examination period, there were three main key issues which affect Turkey relations incited at how many arguments on behalf of Turkey towards EU and member states. First one is the refugee issue under a dual perspective. On the one hand, Turkey your refugee deal, on the other hand, Europe's management, generic uh, speaking. Um, secondly, we have Turkey's integration process in the EU, uh, specifically Turkey's membership preconditions and the, let's say, actions of accessing blockages under Turkey's perspective, uh, either from EU institutions or EU member states. And thirdly, we have Middle East and Eastern Mediterranean issues. Uh, mainly focused on Turkish separations in Syria, Syrian and Kurdish organizations and uh, nature and the coalition uh, among Greece, Cyprus and Israel with US having the role of a guest supporter. All of this under the framework of increased uh, presidential powers by the referendum granted to Mr. Erdogan and fluctuating Turkish economy. So, uh, you know, utilizing this factual dimension and being in continuous dialect with empirical material, four research questions were posed. First of all, which types of hominem arguments are used towards the European Union and certain member states uh, during the period of uh, the examination? Which qualitative characteristics are attributed to European Union and its member states depending on the types of hominem arguments used? how Turkey protects itself, contrasted with its target, and finally, how the Turkey relations are presented over time through the above correlations. But before answering all these questions, uh, what I have to do and I should do is to mention that typology making this uh, current research viable due to its existence. Walton constructed a robust classification system uh, including five types of ad hominem arguments and 17 subtypes. In this uh, empirical material, 10 uh, ad hominem subtypes were detected. Today, I'm going to show you five of them presenting particular interest in the way they are formed and uh, presenting also uh, extra toxic complexion. So from inconsistent commitment, first example, the ad hominem argument accusing the target of doing exactly the opposite thing of a specific commitment. And that is what Ibrahim Kalim does towards European Union, um, refer to the financial assistance that EU should have given to Turkey under their common action plan for uh, the management of the Syrian refugees. So analyzing his argument, we say that EU had committed to give 6 million euros to Turkey as part of the Turkey refugee deal, though EU has delayed the promised finance. 
and therefore it, uh, it's inconsistent in its commitments to Turkey for the management of the issue. And on a second level, Turkey has carried the humanitarian burden of the Syrian war almost alone. Double standards. In this example, presidential spokesperson actually accuses Europe um, of being biased and has uh, having double standards concerning the candidates' membership process uh, only concerning Turkey. Uh, particularly mentioning that Turkey is the only country the 34 chapters imposed on. The major premise of this argument is that European Union always imposes new chapters when it comes to Turkey membership, whereas it has never posed so many chapters and preconditions on any other country. So EU has double standards, so this is bias, and therefore its statements about Turkey's membership uh, should not be given credibility. Now, uh, let's move on. Athletic attacks towards certain member states. Turkey's government used a pragmatic inconsistency at hominem, or simply put, you say one thing, you do another, towards Germany in 2017, mentioning that even though uh, this country claims to aspire to uh, democracy and rule of law, uh, at the same time, um, uh, let's um, uh, terrorist organizations like the PKK, the GPC, and the FIDO uh, in order to operate on its soils. Therefore, Germany's inconsistency in its values because these organizations actually want to destroy these principles and therefore it lacks credibility as a state. Second example, and actually one of my favorites, uh, from Moros towards Cyprus and Greece in 2018. Now, um, I'm sorry. Um, now, this ad hominem argument actually uh, is an abusive one that I mentioned earlier. And now the bad character is the immoral character, is a generic one, a direct in the character of Greece and Cyprus. They say, uh, uh, Turkey's government, that Greece and Cyprus have tried to violate really nobody's sovereign rights in the Eastern Mediterranean through their coalition with other countries. So they're immoral and their arguments are not credible on the issue. They're unreliable partners if they proceed with these agreements. And finally, Turkey will not hesitate to react if this is about to happen. Finally, we have the last example aligned uh, with France, with Turkey's government attacking to France uh, because um, it states that PYD, YPG, and uh, PYG and YPD sorry, differentiate from PKK along with SDF. Um, so it associates France with a terrorist organization, which is quite toxic. Uh, so this argument, uh, calling guilt by association, has this form in this example. France states that SCF, PYG, uh, PYD and YPG are different from PKK. So this means that France behaves as a supporter of the terrorist organization. This means that France is bad. And her arguments about uh, the nature of these organizations are incredible. And Turkey cannot cooperate with this kind of country. Turkey uses against Europe nine different hominem subtypes. Except those mentioned earlier, we have also um, two more abusive arguments from veracity and perception targeting respectively uh, Europe's insincerity and unrealistic view of the politi and political scene. Other additions are circumstantial in narrow sense, um, uh, or simply put, you don't do what you preach, and the poison in the well of hominem depicting the consolidated bias of EU in the Turkish membership process. Community Europe is depicted as misinformer, hypocrite, and European values, and uh, Turkey bias, selective in the fight against terror, and inconsistent in the deal with other countries, and the most toxic of all, as I said before, associated with ter terrorist organizations. Now, moving on the attack, so with specific member states, the pattern is roughly the same, except for the from morals ad hominem, uh, which was mentioned uh, earlier, um, which is absent in the previous uh, category. The member states receiving Turkey's attacks uh, are, of course, the two great powers of the EU, along with our temporal allies, uh, smaller ones, uh, Austria and Belgium, and of course, the close neighbors, Greece and Cyprus. What is interesting to be observed here is that uh, northern countries are attributed the same characteristics uh, with the EU, 
uh, Germany is emerged as a patron and Greece and Cyprus as revisionists, violators of Turkey's uh, sovereign rights and a sec and second level um, internal and immediate enemies. Being the source of this uh, attack, Turkey's government is dressed in three distinct roles, which constitute the escalation of its rhetoric. On the one hand, Turkey adopts the role of the victim of bad Europeans aiming to patronize Turkey's policies, blocking its European accession, and close the country from region of high geopolitical value. This is victim of rhetoric. And victim of rhetoric is based on the logic that people strongly committed to peace, Turkish people, for example, or Turkish government, uh, we can discuss about this if you want, and must believe that the fault for any disruption of their ideal lies with others. After being victimized, Turkey identifies itself as a civilized actor willing to discuss in peace and cooperate, whereas Europeans are inherently described as savages who do not help refugees coming from war, biased against other countries from different cultural backgrounds, conspiring with terrorist organizations to undermine Turkey's national interests. So such statements um, are there to distinguish the civilized from the savage agents in the international community, synthesizing at the same time a meaning of integrated threat. The victim of rhetoric and the contradiction of Turkey's uh, civility to Europe's cruelty are followed by the cultivation of border spirit. Uh, this is when the government is projecting the volition to strike back to ones uh, who try to contempt Turkey's rights on international level, exuding patriot emotions. At this point, war rhetoric becomes even more evident. And in conclusion, um, Turkey mobilized at hominem arguments both towards European Union as a whole and towards European countries specifically, depending on the nature of the issue. The EU and the state members being targeted are projected as unreliable partners over time for multiple issues. And cumulatively, Turkey EU relations are depicted under the dipole of the abuser and the victim, where Turkey represents the latter and EU and its members the former. Turkey built its ethos in the international audience through deconstructing the ethos of Europe. However, the most important aspect of the Turkey EU representation in this context, uh, on a relational level, is that through personal attacks, Turkey's government, apart from legalizing its position on certain, certain political matters in the international community, it also trivializes the essence of European communautaire, a fact confirming Turkey's gradual withdrawal of European integration. Thank you very much for your attention and your time. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, for your presentation and for the very good timekeeping. Um, this allows us to uh, move on to the next uh, presentation, uh, which is going to be uh, by uh, Nasu Safolu, as mentioned before. Uh, I'll give you the floor, Nasu, and then we will discuss all three papers after that. Thanks so much, Hi everyone, and thanks for giving us this opportunity to present a work in progress. And hopefully you are able to see the presentation right now. The yeah. Yes, we are. Thanks. So, basically, first of all, um, I'll be going to sum it up, uh, everything, the work in progress, and then I will go to the uh, go to detail. So, the the title is right now. The title is an ontological security approach to Greek-Turkish relations and Turkey's EU bid. Um, authored by me and my uh, PhD supervisor, uh, Professor Dimitri, whose last name I cannot pronounce, sorry for that. So, um, basically, uh, to sum it up, um, there are two different uh, stories here, uh, narrativizing the same uh, relation, the bilateral relations of Greeks and Turkey. And uh, on the one hand, Ankara has been becoming a more independent and more assertive, assertive regional actor, steering away from the EU. And in contrast, there is Greece, which is which has been becoming more and more European in orientation, and therefore their narrative is changing, which is called changing continuity in ontological security literature. So there is continuity, but 
in, in, in we didn't continue to this change and this change uh, has brought a more strained relations with the EU in the case of Turkey. So basically the paper is actually about uh, Greece and Turkey's self-narratives and, uh, and we are trying to make sense of their self-narratives through their bilateral relations and then we are trying to explain how it takes a toll on Turkey's EU bid. But here now it's it's a bit too complicated and it's uh, I mean, for me it's too uh, hard to explain all of it in 15 minutes. So I will be focusing on uh, Turkey's uh, um, staff narrative and how this narrative is Turkey. So in the as a table of content, first I will be talking about theoretical commitments, then the case, then the research questions. I will give the research questions, and probably I will have no time for the methodology. And methodology is the least uh, important part because it's most technicality. So uh, it is what makes sense the, or the paper without it. So for the theoretical commitment and the table you are seeing now is. Uh, uh, actually authored by, uh, it is from a paper authored by Ben J. Steele in 2005. It describes ontological security as comparing it to traditional definition of security. So I won't be explaining the table to you, it's uh, right here, but I will be talking about uh, several concepts of, in ontological security so that I mean, it's possible to understand what's the difference between traditional understanding of security and ontological security. And basically, first of all, I will be talking about being. Being is one of the most crucial concepts here. And uh, I mean, branches, the way branches still has prepared this table, uh, he Mm, his thoughts emanated from mm, sociological understanding of ontological security, and <laughs> from understanding of ontological security, but mine is more uh, existential understanding. So uh, the way he discussed being is something else, but for me, I, uh, it's more about uh, Dasein or Heidegger. So Martin Heidegger understands that, I mean, Dasein literally means being there, in German, and this being there doesn't mean that, I mean, does not amount to being on a particular space on a particular time. It's mostly a being in and being involved in the world. So it's actually becoming. So you are being involved in the world and it's a continuity. It's, it's, it's not, it's not a, it's, it's temporal, it's going on. So it's doing something or deliberating over, over something, being part of something. So being basically is uh, that's why we will I will be talking about narratives because being is all about becoming and this becoming is all about how you narrativize your past events because um, there is uh, there is no uh, body in the uh, in the exact sense of a state but there is this being and being is made sense of its it story. And second of all, I'd like to talk about routines. Routines are uh, here. Routines is more. I um, should call in one of your papers uh, defined routines. Uh, they are said there are two different routines institutionalized, institutionalized and non institutionalized. The latter, the non institutionalized ones, are uh, everyday routines like practices, everyday practices of citizens, daily routines, their social interactions. But the former one is a nationwide ontological framework that provides and uh, and manages ontological security and and in turn it uh, ontological security uh, enables a stable and coherent self uh, and self is actually uh, what we mean as being so in the traditional sense self is identity and self is understood as identity and in, in ontological security we are understanding self as i mean some of the in my case, in existential understanding, it's self as being, and these the there is this the institutionalized and non-institutionalized routines help us to narrativize our being and in turn uh, have an ontologically secure self and have a um, continual 
con have continuity in our uh, relations. And this understanding in here, uh, there's this interaction between non-institutionalized and institutionalized routines. And institutionalized routines, such as speech acts and commemoration date days, contribute to the construction of non-institutionalized institutionalized everyday routines. And in turn, non-institutionalized routines exert influence over institutionalized sort of organization, meaning actually the, uh, the statements of uh, politicians, for example, uh, have, uh, have some impact on people's, people's understanding of what's going on, and in turn, people in time may, have ex uh, may, may exert influence on, uh, on politicians' statements later on. And then there's this uh, routines and self-identity in the second line, in the second row. And self-identity as a concept uh, is substituted as uh, self as being in, in, uh, in my understanding. And it's actually, uh, in, in, in basically, it's all about narrativization. So I will talk about narrativization here. Uh, a narrative is actually is, is, is social constructed and it's a one vantage point of, of an event at the expense of other understanding of understandings or perceptions of the same event. So it's selective and serves a purpose. It omits that it includes, forgets, and remembers. Sometimes uh, it goes through denial. So uh, there are particular details every narrative focuses on. Even even if uh, regarding the same event, there can be several narratives. Focuses on particular details, remembers particular details, but forgets about the others. So it's it's emotive. It's an emotive process as much as it's an it's a cognitive process. So the self narrative is fundamentally a story of units take of what happened up to now. And it's recursively narrated, and because self as being, as we said, is a process of becoming, so it keeps going and it's continual, and and it supplies a unit with biographical continuity and enables the unit uh, to realize what is what it is and what its place in the international affairs. And a unit resorts to its self, its self narrative so as to make sense of its uh, surroundings. And bilateral relations and international relations. And, and, and as experiences accumulate, the self narrative gets created and developed, and so on, and revised. And there is we lost him. I think we lost him. Are you there? Can you hear us? So, right. is, uh, a collectivity, a group of people always uh, prefer particular memories over others and forgets and remembers them and develop a reasonable narrative. And this reasonable narrative becomes the backbone of their being. And, 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 meaning the, and, and the, it's, it reassures them their past, present, and future. And it, it either takes a toll on their bilateral relations or let it drive. And that. Um, uh, yes, we cannot hear you. There is a problem with your connection. Can you hear us? No? Nasu? Uh, it has, right, so, uh, has addressed the angst. Uh, Nasu, sorry. Uh, we, you may not be realizing that, but you come and go. We can't hear most of the things you say over uh, the last sorry. few minutes. Um, it's been a few minutes. Uh, we, we couldn't hear the last few sentences. Let's give it another okay. try. Okay. Please. Okay. I was talking about memory in the last few minutes, I guess. So, and memory is 
basically the big point of uh, narrativization and uh, and we it's all about memory politics we are remembering and forgetting certain memories in certain ways and the same memories are, be, are being uh, defined in 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 different ways or similar ways by different units um, a, a turkish a turkish person remembers uh, the same uh, event uh, in a way that contradicts with the Greek person's understanding of it, maybe. And it's the same for units too. It's the same for states, it's the same for uh, societies, etc. And there's sense of belonging. It's another concept in ontological security, which is important in our case because, I mean, it, it, even uh, Turkey and Greece have a sense of belonging to their nations and also have a sense of belonging to European Union. I mean, for now, maybe in, in nowadays, Turkey doesn't have one a sense of belonging to EU because it's disrupted. But up to now, uh, in, especially in the early 2000s, Turkey had one. And these, as long as these two senses of belonging are in contradiction with each other, here comes anxiety, here comes uh, uh, disrupted narrativization and comes ontologically insecure unit, which is anxious and makes its decisions in, uh, in emotively, and re, uh, emo, uh, it, it, it makes emotive reactions to what happens in their bilateral relations. So as, as the last one, the, the last concept is anxiety. Um, um, anxiety is on basic anxiety with, with, with one sentence. Anxiety is, uh, I, I will just talk about the fear and its, diff its difference with anxiety. Because, Turkey, for example, Turkey is a fear object for Greece, uh, and, and this fear object, and, and vice versa, and this fear object uh, helps these units to ease their anxieties uh, and have an ontologically secure narrative of themselves. And uh, so, for, in this way, the two units may prefer uh, uh, enmity over amity. And for this reason, anxiety is important in ontological security. And the differences in fear sprung from a particular trait, in contrast to anxiety, is uh, is free floating. There is no fear object, and uh, so anxiety debilitates and engulfs one, and and has so many, uh, and it it uh, prevents unit from making rational decisions. So we are uh, in ontological security. If we have an anxiety free state, we can have pacific relations. This is the point. So basic ontological security is confidence in the biographical continuity and coherence of the milieu and the environment. And it drives it it is the drive to minimize uncertainty by imposing cognitive order on the environment, thus reducing anxiety and creating ontologically secure environs for the unit. So it matters because it provides a vantage point that elucidates the mechanisms for and the impulses to a quasi-erratic and nonsensical actions of units. So, I mean, in this context, in this context of ontological security, we try to uh, analyze uh, the bilateral relations between Greece and Turkey and its impact on Turkey's EU peace. And, and we, we try to, we, we on the way we understood that Greece is, a, is on a quest to Europeanize itself and uh, align itself with EU norms and transform into a less nationalist and more European uh, state. And uh, uh, meanwhile, Turkey um, swings back and forth. Uh, on the one hand, there's this conservative narrativization of itself and within in, and its vicinity. And on the other, newly emerging, uh, though, the, uh, as I said, n n disrupted nowadays, sense of belonging to European, Europeanization and European norms. So in, in Turkey's case, it's, it, this um, contradiction is, is in a deep level. And our assumption is that the narrativization of bilateral relations on both sides is an attempt to uh, make sense of their selves. In, Cells of the, these units. For instance, Ankara uh, nar narrated Semitis era, uh, Semitis, uh, Kostas Semitis, uh, this ascent of Kostas Semitis to Prime Ministry was in uh, 1996, and 
uh, Ankara had narrated this Simitis era policies and Europeanization of bilateral relations uh, as uh, detrimental to its own interest because it it sees uh, it think, regards uh, uh, Europeanization of bilateral relations as a trump card for uh, Athens. And it believes that Athens embroils in the EU, embroils the EU in the bilateral relations in an attempt to weaken Turkey's case by drawing attention to several. And, and, and Turkey, Turkey does that by drawing attention to several crises like Kardak EMEA crisis, uh, Öcalan crisis, and Cyprus issue. And Turkey believes that Athens plays the EU as a diplomatic trump card. So this is uh, the narrativization of the same issue is quite contradictory, and and I, I will now mention a few statements of uh, several Greek and Turkish uh, politicians together with a couple of uh, EU officials, and then try to uh, narrativize the bilateral relations through these statements. And first of all, I will mention the uh, Athens narrativization of Ankara. For example, the current PM of Greece's statement regarding Turkey lately in his talk with Cyprus Prime Minister, I guess. He said that I would say that they, they, the Republic of Turkey, turn against Europe as a whole, not just as not just our two countries. Europe must now prepare a specific list of actions and sanctions against a country that seeks to play the role of a regional troublemaker. And also he says we we also discussed President Erdogan's unprecedented decision of Hagia Sophia, and which hurts us deeply as Greek Orthodox Christians, but also citizens of the world. And it's not a Greek Turkish matter, it's a Euro Turkish matter, maybe actually it's a global matter. You see. There's also the statement of Deputy Prime Minister to the PM and government spokesperson, Stelios Petsas, I guess. And he says, the conversion of Sophia into a mosque and the performance that was set up there are a challenge not only for Greeks and Christians everywhere, but also for the whole Western and civilized world. And another statement in an interview, alternate minister of foreign affairs said, Turkey does not respect multiculturalism and is not a country firmly oriented towards Turkey. These are all Europeanized uh, statements. These are all uh, in in one way, one, one can narrativize it as a, a Greece becoming and aligning itself with European norms. So understanding, it, it understands this, uh, what happens in the, recon, the reconversion of Hagia Sophia into a mosque or uh, Turkey's assertive policies in this sense. But in Ankara's narrativization of Athens and the EU, it's, it's something else. So, uh, for example, FM, Tur FM of Turkey, Çavuşoğlu, says EU's policies should be informed by EU's common values and criteria towards Turkey. And EU-Turkey relations has become hostage to Greece-Turkey and Cyprus-Turkey bilateral relations. Or Erdogan says, I suggest the ones that challenge in Turkey to reread their recent history. Or head of Turkish National Movement Party, Devlet Bahçeli, they say, once he said in 2018, the sea is full of the meaning uh, agency, I guess. The sea is full of the grandfathers of those who speak with such empty words. Or uh, it seems that Greece's appetite and desire to be thrown into the sea has swelled again. So this is much more conservative. It's, there is no Europeanization anymore. It's a disruption to e Turkey's sense of belonging to the EU. So there's also uh, EU's officials' views of Turkey, a couple of them, uh, Joseph Borrell and uh, Natalia Tochi. High, high representative of the EU, uh, Joseph Borrell, he says the empires are coming back. There are at least three of them. We can say Russia, China, and Turkey, big empires in the past. And this is actually, the, this statement helps somehow contributes to uh, Turkish narrative in a sense that uh, to prove that actually there is a conflict going on. There is no uh, via media, there is no common ground. And we are actually in a Mm, yeah, I don't know, maybe they would call it a crusade. And and the second one, uh, Natalia Tochi, a special advisor to Joseph Borrell, Borrell, I guess, is, she says EU should pivot from half-hearted confrontation to a rule-based relationship with Ankara. So these statements indicate that uh, there's not one but many uh, narrativizations of the same event and contradicting 
contradicting statements send mixing the signals to the other side. Then the other side ascribes meaning to these statements. Maybe they don't, they misunderstand. Maybe they do understand, who knows. Uh, and, uh, it, and, and then they emotively act later, later. And this creates a downward spiral. And additionally, there is this uh, flank state psychology in both sides. And this, uh, the, the feeling of being outliers weighs on their narratives and relations with the EU and NATO. In the case of Athens, Athens is disappointed on the EU's response to Turkey regarding East Mate and the rest of the issues. Whereas Ankara regards several EU official statements about Turkey, Greece Turkey border uh, being the European border, EU's external border, as alienation of Ankara by the EU. So it's the same events, same statements, but both sides are mm, dissatisfied with. But still, they, the way uh, they, they go through disruption and they, the way they narrativize is uh, different. So on the one hand, I think like it's like Sorry, 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 Would you would you mind uh, wrapping up? To, um, yeah. yeah, yeah. I can just say that these two units and self narrative and narrativization of each other provide ontological security by display dispelling their anxiety. Athens reorganizes itself and aligns its policies with European norms. It doesn't find the support it seeks from EU. So anxiety aroused by this situation, on the one hand, leads Athens to further antagonize Ankara and transform it into a fear object and decreases its anxiety. But on the other, uh, it bases its relations with Ankara on European norms as a rational response to allay its anxieties, two different uh, answers to their anxieties. One in one, they turn Turkey into a fear factor, being prisoners of their anxieties. Or on the other, they are uh, confronting their anxieties and coming up with a pacific solution. But in Turkey's case, Turkey regards this Europeanization as a real political move, also regards the way the EU deals with the uh, issue as hypocrisy and attempts to un undermine Ankara's regional cloud. So this new narrativization of the other and self-narrative arouses anxiety, the anxiety, and the anxiety leads to ontological insecurity. Thank you so much. Sorry for the long presentation. Okay, Th thank you very much, uh, Nasu. Thank you to all um, paper givers. I think it is definitely worth us uh, engaging in some discussion with um, reference to your papers, and uh, you will allow me to sort of try and throw out a few of those um, questions to you because uh, since we are not in a conventional real uh, conference format it's impossible to have questions from the audience as it were uh, not least due to the way in which we are running this so over the next few minutes and will I, uh, I will have to ask you all to try and be a bit short to make sure that we finish um, at a relatively normal time can I ask, ask all of you, there is one question which is common to, to Carol, Dimitra and Nasu, and that relates to uh, the empirical part of the research you conduct on Turkey. Now, our panel is entitled Discussing Turkey's European Agenda and Policy, um, which is actually quite striking if you consider that many question whether there is anything related to Turkey's foreign policy that has to do with Europe uh, in terms of uh, consistency and coherence. So my, my question to all of you is, what exactly is it that Turkey's policy vis-a-vis -vis the European Union today actually stands for, right? So is it a transactional relationship based on the idea of exchanging certain benefits. Carol was talking about the refugee and migration deal, for instance. Is it more an attempt to build on Turkey's regional power status in order to claim the right of EU membership in the future, even if the political criteria are certainly not fulfilled? What exactly is Turkey's policy strategy uh, with regard to the European Union uh, today? And I, I ask this because I think there's a lot of confusion as to whether there is one of those policies and what they stand for. Now, in terms of uh, concrete questions, I want to have one question for each presenter. Uh, 
And the first one goes to uh, Carol, who talked about um, the, the refugee migration crisis. Can I ask the following, uh, Carol? Uh, I don't know if you're looking into this in your paper, but um, the question is, you, you referred to uh, Egypt promises towards Turkey, such as opening up another accession chapter and promising visa liberalization. To what extent was that policy victim of Germany's um, desire to get a deal quite quickly in order to minimize the, the domestic political cost for the American government? Uh, I say this because many have argued that given Turkey's record by the year that the migration and refugee crisis erupted, um, the two things, i.e. Turkey's accession perspective and the EU deal, deal uh, on migration should not be confused. And yet the EU did exactly that by confusing the two issues, right? Promising the possibility of visa liberalization if Turkey fulfilled all criteria, promising to uh, open another chapter in negotiation. So, you know, how do you see this, uh, this development uh, and how do you analyze it? Um, to Dimitra, uh, great paper, very conceptual, uh, very uh, analytical, uh, great work by yourself and Thanasis Samaras. Can I ask you, given everything that you have outlined and the interpretive framework that you used, um, at some point, you talked about how during the double standards thesis, uh, following the train of logic that you have outlined, the EU arguments have no credibility. This is the argument on the part of the Turkish government, right? So you, you compared and contrast the statements and you said EU arguments, well, they're not credible, forget about them. And when I was listening to this, the, the first thing that came to my mind was, is that really what the Turkish government is trying to communicate? Or are they trying to communicate an attempt, and that links up to Nasu's paper, of seeking to establish themselves as having the right to be a privileged discussant with Europe, and therefore trying to undermine rhetorically, of course, um, as some of the European Union's reactions to Turkey's policy behavior? In other words, is it really that the Turkish government today uh, espouses these arguments? Does the Turkish government really speak on behalf of the Turkish nation, as it claims, given that we know that Turkey is a very polarized society uh, and very, very many of the Turkish people do not uh, accept the Turkish government's arguments? Or is it simply, uh, you know, an attempt to play a regional power role, so to speak? Um, that, that's for Dimitra. And finally, to Nasu, uh, so, sounds very exciting, the ontological security approach. Uh, I think there's, there's a lot to build on. And, and I think that the last two papers in particular, Dimitras and Nasu, speak to each other. So maybe you want to communicate about your work because the, the commonalities are obvious, I think. Uh, you employ this discursive, narrative-based analysis. Um, the, the one thing I want to, to point out um, with regard to Nasu's and Dimitrios's paper is your emphasis on fear and anxiety. Uh, which I think is a, is a great attempt to sort of make a story which sometimes is presented as a very simplistic story, both from the Greek and the Turkish side, uh, much more complicated. And personally, I happen to think you're absolutely right. Um, I mean, you're really hitting it on the nail. One event is completely di in interpreted differently by both sides, and that then you know leads to an avalanche of misunderstandings which have led to the rapid deterioration in Greek-Turkish relations. But since you were talking about um, the fear and anxiety, I wonder what, where the, you know, again, wh where is the public policy slash public diplomacy element in this? If, if Greece is, your, is a Europeanized state who is, or claiming to be a Europeanized state, who is sort of, um, quote unquote, hiding behind the European Union, and Turkey is following the opposite path, how on earth is it possible um, that Greek and Turkish political elites will see eye to eye by way of trying to reconcile their existing differences? Um, it seems that if we throw a lot of the psychological element into this, maybe we leave out the, the, the necessary diplomatic dirty work that needs to be conducted to make sure that we don't end up with, with further conflict. But I will leave you to answer this. If you don't mind, um, shall we start from the reverse order? So start with Nasu. Continue with Dimitra and then finish with Carol, if that's okay. Okay, for me, thanks for the questions. And thank, 
Thank you so much for your um, comment. So regarding Turkey EU relations and how it's impacted by uh, in, in the way I understand in my case, I mean it's actually um, Turkey understand uh, the way actually the FM of Turkey Chavushol said. I mean they, Turkey thinks that I mean its relations with uh, not only Greece but also Cyprus. These two bilateral relations are. Uh, taken hostage its relations with the EU uh, and it believe in, I mean in, in 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 European Union case and European Union for EU members it's just ordinary because I mean this this country is a part of EU and its interest must be also defended somehow and also there are these norms that uh, Europeans do believe or try to uh, align themselves, their national interests, with uh, with these norms. It is it's not only Greece; it's also many other countries in in the EU. They are all trying to align themselves uh, to a different to to, dif to to different degrees. Some of them are managing it; some of them cannot. But but at the end, they are trying to go. I mean, there's this certain uh, path they are navigating through. But in in Turkish case, Tur uh, in, in Turkish case, Turkey. The way it understands this is as, as hypocrisy, because Turkey believes that, uh, that um, and re with references to certain e issues like uh, Cyprus becoming a member of EU and and uh, France taking a taking uh, it's, uh, e uh, Greece's side. The way Turkey understands that in the opinion of Ankara, this is all uh, in this, this is all quite telling for them, and it's, uh, it makes them believe that. These um, actions speak louder than their uh, their discourse, and at the end, this this is a disruption to Turkey's sense of belonging to EU because Turkey, back in the day, especially in uh, early two thousands, believed that it was a part of EU and somehow uh, becoming a EU state, and it uh, and it had had these strong emotive reactions, and then there was this disruption to their understanding and this disruption uh, becomes uh, an anxiety because at this point uh, you either uh, turn transform uh, the other into alienate the other as a made by making them a fear factor or you face your anxieties on uh, and uh, try to look for a rational and pacific solution. But in Turkey's case, it's it, it's going for a different direction, maybe the opposite, and more uh, and steering away this understanding of EU. And coming to the second question, I fear and anxiety. Uh, I I talked a little bit about it now, but the the way fear and and. and, and there's not actually a wrong way or right way in this case for ontological security. A, a, a state may uh, build its case on fear or anxiety. It's all uh, it, it all is quite telling, and it all uh, can be used in a certain way to to go for a pacific solution. Uh, I didn't mention this part, but I mean there's three forms of anxiety, and they're all uh, informing certain um, worries of states. And uh, as long as these worries are addressed like uh, self uh, ontic I mean, anxiety of death, meaninglessness, guilt, condemnation. I mean, that means that season to exist in a, for a state, season to exist for the other as a passive, in a pacific way. Or the meaninglessness means that, I mean, there's no systems of meaning. The state can um, align its policies, its relations with. Or there's this guilt, condemnation, and this guilt and condemnation is the lack of ethical code. And in Turkey's case, Turkey is going through all of it somehow because it's in a really contradiction. And and as long as these uh, anxieties are not addressed, it will keep uh, keep uh, calling the EU and Athens as its fear object. And for the and the public diplomacy part in Turkey, it's a bit uh, different because I mean, in the EU, it's a more, 
I mean, I can call it more, let's call it a more rest Western democracy. And in Turkey, it's, it's a bit different. So making a comparison between the two would be a bit hard in this case. That's why, uh, uh, first, that's why we are foc I'm focusing on state level, because I mean, public public's voice matters, but uh, in this case, both states going through anxieties and may turn in the, each other into a fear object. So, people's narrative also is being uh, hugely affected on by these narratives. So, they they are becoming a prisoners of this uh, conflictuous uh, narrative, and then they it's more it's mostly the institutionalized part. Take, uh, weighing on the non institutionalized people's part. So that's why it's a bit more complicated in, the, in that form. Thank you very much. Very much. So great. Um, thanks a lot. Can we move on to Dimitra, please? Yes, uh, of course. Um, thanks a lot for your feedback. And I'm going to be short and concise. Uh, I'm going to start with a question about the empirical material because uh, the answer is shorter. Um, the ad hominem arguments used by Turkey on first place, on, on first level of reading, is an attempt to build ca the country's credibility at, uh, as um, concerning to its narrative as I mentioned earlier, uh, and at the same time, whatever accusation EU has pointed out towards Turkey to uh, be hit and lose credibility. So that is why uh, the uh, specific tool was chosen. On a second level, the strategic level, because it's a tactical one, the strategic level, of course, it is to uh, project a specific version of Turkey relations. Like, we are not the bad guys. We are going to cooperate better, and we want to be a part of your organization and your e union, uh, but under our own terms. Like, because, you know, where you're poisoning us too much preconditions, come on, other countries didn't have that preconditions. Like, you know, that, that's an attempt to actually trivialize the value of being a member of uh, the EU. And the reason lying behind this is the, uh, the fear and the in insecurity that Nashu actually mentioned earlier, because at this point of speaking, Turkey cannot be a member. But Cyprus is, Greece is, and actually many years ago. So this is insecurity. And this actually um, is, um, um, let's say, um, a reaction of projecting ourselves like Tur Turkey's government, like uh, we're strong, but we actually were not. But we're going to project that we have other alternatives. We have Russia, we have um, uh, US, we have other bilateral, we have uh, Libya, or, for example. And I've actually, actually, this is connected to the second question you made, uh, that Turkey wants to be a part of the uh, European Union. But this point of speaking, this is like, is it, sold. It's sold um, even from their agenda, because they have other issues. They have the Eastern Mediterranean. They cannot... Uh, think of not co-exploiting in the exclusive economic zone in Cyprus. They cannot think of it. They, they say this is unacceptable because we have a part of the land, we have entitlements. In the GNC, the same. So uh, they, they are panicked right now with many things and they feel isolated under many perspectives. And that is why they, uh, they cannot claim that we are weak. We are. We cannot do anything. We have to uh, actually compromise. And because they cannot say this, they say we cannot compromise because you're unjustified, you're illegal, you're you're biased, and you're the wrong one. We are the right. So uh, that's the essence. Okay. Thank you very much, Dimitra, for your answer. Uh, Carol, can we move on to you, please? Yeah, sure. Thank you for this question. So. Uh, considering this, I think we should uh, we have to admit that Turkey has an advantage 
this uh, relation because they they can play with the migration card and also uh, a lot of in terms of the economy uh, Germany uh, has a lot of companies uh, in and a lot of factories in Germany so they know already that they have advantage and they are trying to use this as much as possible in the uh, uh, relations so possible even this will be like win and losing so at the same time uh, during the negotiation I mean during that uh, my when the crisis uh, starts so Actually, he was trying. Turkey was trying to win as much as possible in this in this negotiation. And uh, however, they knew already that the, the conditions of, uh, I mean, for example, in order to uh, let Turkish people to visit uh, European countries uh, without any restriction will be impossible to fulfill. So regulation uh, were, were very high to accept these conditions. So finally. Uh, even when I was in Turkey at that time, I talked with some professor. They 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 mentioned that it's impossible for Turkey to fulfill this uh, condition. So this is just diplomacy, and it's always going to postpone this uh, problem as the politicians are doing always. So actually, we have to also mention. Uh, we have to bear in mind that uh, actually nowadays, I mean during the last decades, the identity of Turkey of Turkish not only. Um, Politicians, but the society has changed, and uh, Turkey has uh, different uh, agenda nowadays. Before, if we take a look, the first uh, uh, years of the AK Party, I mean, the beginning of the 21st century, there were a need to be to implement some of the reforms to be me be member states. Even the society expressed their very pretty warm attitude, and uh, after years. Uh, Everything has changed, and Turkey is trying to find their own way and to became uh, not even the regional re re reader, but uh, but also they want leader, but they want to be playing a very important role uh, in 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 the world. So, and uh, they don't want to be depend dependent on European Union, even on Russia. They want to have their own. Uh, uh, very strong position in the world, and they are trying to do their best in this case. So uh, in now, nowadays, European Union became like a partner, uh, but this is not the main partner uh, for Turkey to uh, collaborate with all the neighbors if they will see some benefits. And uh, and also regarding the identity, Turkey also became more uh, uh, anti-European. Uh, due to the migration crisis as well, because they, they start to think that the European Union doesn't really care about the Muslim, and uh, this is the Christian club, and they will never let us to be members of the state. And moreover, the, this is the part of the Turkish DNA as well. I mean, the became more Turkish people are, um, uh, I mean, this contains element of Islam and also uh, nationalistic ideology. So. Um, they will try to be their own way, and even uh, I conduct some of the survey among the Turkish students, and I ask them uh, about their identity, whether they consider themselves as a Asian, uh, maybe from the Middle East, or European. So only five percent of them uh, mention in this in this uh, polls that they are European. So and majority of them mention that we are Asian. So this is part of the Turkish. Uh, identity and uh, the history. So actually, they don't consider themselves as European as well. However, they have a very strong also uh, European culture is very strong uh, part of the Turkish identity as uh, as well. But uh, uh, Turkey has changed in the last uh, decade and became more uh, self-independent and want to find their own way. Okay. Right. Thank you, thank you very much, Carol. Uh, unless you have any other uh, comment to make, um, I think it's time for us to wrap up. Uh, can I thank you all very much for your presentations? Um, and what is certain is that given your area of work around Turkey, that uh, good or bad, uh, certainly Turkey has uh, been hitting the headlines and it seems we will continue to hit the headlines, so you will all have a lot of work to do. So. <laughs> 
Thank you all very much for being here today. Um, and um, best of best of luck with your continued work. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. It was a pleasure. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.